Okay, now here's an important one. What are your favorite yes, bad sir. movies? Uh, well, you, we kind of talked about it. I think we should go. We should continue with Cobra. I think Cobra's up there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, you know, we talked. We we you know, um, it's. it's so I, I was thinking about that too. We we said about this. Like with that film, just for the cheesiness of it, just for the, the, the one liners. That's a like George P. Cospanos. I should say his name right. Directed that movie. Stallone wrote it. And we and I geeked about it. We talked about how that originally would have been his version of Beverly Hills Cop. Yep. That's a bad movie. You know what film is bad? It's I told a friend about it, and she got me not more. Another friend of mine, Notting Hill. That film is a I, that's a little too sappy for me. But to be fair, it's not bad. We can talk about. Um, I think Michael Collins is a really bad movie. Julia Roberts doing doing a Irish accent, not going to fly. <laughs> that's a that's a bad movie. Oh man, you know it's hard. You know, uh, make, no, give me an actor, and I'll try to think. So many movies. Give me an actor, and try to think of a bad movie. Um. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll name one of mine right now, and I saw it in the movie theaters twice. Freddie Got Fingered with Tom Green. Horribly wow. bad movie, but he he swung for the fences and he missed wildly, but I, I watched that movie with a smile on my face like, if he can do this, then maybe I have a chance one day. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you this. Were you, were, were you on any sort of substances or were you completely sober? Completely sober. Both times? Both times. All right, man. Hey, look, hey, dude, we, we got him. That's that. Okay. Um, oh, oh, God. All right. Here's a film. Picasso Trigger. What happened was, and so the film's called Picasso Trigger. Really, 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 really bad movie. <laughs> like, like, literally, like, I mean, just no plot. Just any, like, literally, these, the two women on the movie are these really super duplicately over boot sized women who want to show their, show their breasts all the time. Terrible, cheesy movie. <laughs> That's that one. Oh, I got another one I like watching. I've seen in a long time. American Ninja 2. There's a bad movie to watch. <laughs> oh, I got, I, in, 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 based in New York, you've probably seen plenty of them and probably been to their studios, but The Toxic Avenger from Troma Films. You know what? The first one, the first one I think was kind of funny because it just, it's so silly. I mean, they, I mean, I, I was watching the movie. I was like, I, man, he needs to get, but he get get to come up and, I mean, I'm, oh wow, I remember that film too. He, he's, uh, the, the gang that beat, that picks on him, the kids in school, he gets thrown out the window into the big toxic thing, comes home and just gets revenge. Like the scene, the scene, it's, it's bad. It's funny. It's so bad. It's funny. But these guys hold up the uh, the fast food place. Hey, my name is Sticks, and this and that. And like, dude, it's just so. I mean, it's just so bad. I mean, just you watch and you go, "Why are you watching this?" Because it's so bad. Oh. Like it's like it's it's like that with with with, with another true movie, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Oh, ho, 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 that funny one there. It, it, Toxic Avenger though was actually Marissa Tomei's first movie. Who was she in the movie? What 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 character? She was in a. It was near the end of the film, I believe. But she, she I don't believe she had any lines. But she walked out uh, of the shower with a with a towel on, and you you see you see her face. I mean, you know her now. At the time, I guess you wouldn't you wouldn't know it. Marissa told me, right. who cares? But that was her first movie. Um, I know uh, Vincent D'Onofrio got his start. Uh, on a, on a trauma film, um, it was a, one of the silly uh, summer camp uh, sex movies that they uh, did in the early eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, Cannibal the mm-hmm. Musical. Cannibal the Musical was another great uh, film that Trauma made. That uh, that was Trey Parker and Matt Stone's first movie. Oh, really? Okay, I got, I got a, Oh, you? Know, oh, wow. Okay. What, what think of Orgasmo? I watched that with my dad, and that was a big mistake because <laughs> it was awkward. But I thought that was funny. Uh-huh. You know it's weird. Uh, I, we had I at some point. I think my the company I worked for. We were going to do that movie, so we actually had the DHS and, I, and my boss said, "Just look at it." And I was like, "It was a, it was a wild cut version of what they're going for, but you could see where their heads are at." Mm-hmm. And I think this 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 was done literally. I think maybe at the first second season of of South Park because I think they wanted to go into film, so they were doing that. That was that. Oh, here's a little tidbit that I share. Originally, my boss did Boogie Nights. Nice. But there is we I, there is an NC seventeen version that that you that's hard to find. Now there, I'll explain. I, I the reason why I say that because we talk about bad. Not I mean, Good Grace was a great film, but we said about that. I remember I, it just kind of sparked a thing in my head. Was so I when I first saw that we had we was, I think we, it was NC seventeen copy that we had. 
So you've seen Boogie Nights, I swear, quite a few times. The scene in the movie where when Bill walks down the hallway and sees his wife having sex. In the entertainment version, the camera actually follows him back and you see him going at it. Mm-hmm. Nicole, uh, Be- Becky Barnett, right? We don't know what happens to her, but we kind of know we, she's in an abusive relationship with her where she meets her, that her husband. He literally beats her up because he's so frustrated that she was a former porn star. And at the end of the movie where everyone's kind of reconciling, she's working in a nursing home. So those scenes got cut out the movie as well. But, you know, you can see why. Because, you know, when you see the film now, I saw it. I can see why I did that. I, that, was, that was an interesting film. I mean, yeah, I remember working for the company. And I think they had, they started to do the film. But at, at time, you know, they, they ran out of money. New Line, you know, this was P.T. Anderson's second movie. And they didn't, like, we didn't know what to do with it. And once they did the final cut and my boss did it, I mean, that, I mean, that set everything up in motion for him. That set everything up happening that way. So little tidbit in there I'll, I'll throw in um another bad movie i was thinking about i'm trying to think of can because all the canon movies oh the exterminator series exterminator 3 <laughs> mario van peebles that's the one i remember see, I'm, i remember seeing that because uh <laughs> we we had just gotten um we had a vcr and there wasn't a block you know at the time you know there wasn't a blockbuster in my neighborhood so there's kind of these third counter rental houses where you got to pay an arm and a leg to get a movie. If you don't get it back, they charge you. And it was the, it was, it, it was Exterminator 3. I remember that film. I remember the cheesy soundtrack. That was just, I, don't, I think the Ken, I think Ken did that film, but it was just so, I mean, it was so bad. It's so good, man. You know, films that bad that we talk about, are just, you know, it's just a bad, it's a train wreck. And it's like, you just got to sit back and watch it, man. You can't, can't think about it. You can't say what you got to, you just got to watch it happen. Cause it's just, Cause I I worked on a I worked on films that I was like what am I doing this films like you know what you gotta ride this film out man you have no idea what to expect it's a paycheck you got to put it on a resume but uh, yeah but speaking of that I mean and, and kind of speaking to what we were talking about earlier with the Matrix it is mm-hmm. weird that Hollywood is at least as far as movies go are kind of contracting they're they're getting more formulaic with their movies. I, mm-hmm. If I had to think about it, I think The Matrix may be the last big original idea movie that really hit it big. I can't really think of anything else that was an original idea that made that much of an impact. And, you know, that has me thinking, I mean, what what is the future of movies? Are people going to go? I think, well, it's what's happening now. Well, from from what I when I was out there in L.A. at the time. The independents were way to go, right? There were, you can you can have the best of both worlds. Your studio, you can still back your big name projects, but the little ones will happen. So if you're a filmmaker like say like Chris Nolan, yes, we'll give you Batman, but you do the films. Now Chris Nolan flipped it, and in between the Batmans, he did uh, you know he, he he did Prestige, he did he did um, Inception, and he did Interstellar. So he he has made enough money for Warner Brothers Twenty Four, so he does Dunkirk, which is worth catching definitely mm-hmm. for that. But nowadays, because I think that they want a sure thing, and because you're seeing more actors become more producers, so for instance, you know, right now, what rules has been has been the comic movies? Since Wonder Woman has has really cemented DC as we have, we actually for the first time next to the Batman film, we have a legitimate movie that made a lot of money that was. Directed by a woman that literally was appealed. So if you didn't know the Wonder Woman story, you still liked the film. I thought the film was one of the best films of the year. So now we're going to wait for Justice League. And as, and as Marvel has, we're all waiting for Thor. But for me, it's Black Panther. So yeah, they, they, they want to go. they want to go that way because I think the executives are more businessmen. They're no more, I mean, the days of, of a, a studio head giving you car blank, those days are over. Mm-hmm. When Steven Spielberg has to get asked for funding, think about that. Steven Spielberg is one of the wealthiest men on the planet. He he can make any film, any style, and is loved. When he has to ask and beg for money, that's a big deal. When Lucas so now remember George Lucas originally wanted to do Red Tails. No studio wanted to help him. No studio. Think about that. This dude has made billions with Star Wars, the first original four, three. So he said, "After I'll do it myself." And you know, if you see Red Tails, you know I I love the movie. I think it could have been done better, but. Luke, you know, that's what happens. You need guys like a Lucas who has money, who doesn't mind, who it's for him. It's nothing. He can afford to do it. He's not, George Lucas is not going to lose money. He, 
he's probably a multi-billionaire and I don't care what it says even though he sold his his stuff to Disney he still makes a back end he still gets money in the end maybe not as much but I think you know he gave up his control for some financial there's no way he gave up that golden that golden goose without having something on side uh, and even though Lucasfilms no longer appears on it yeah, and and I mean the guy's rich beyond compare with with Star exactly. Wars. They sold it for four billion dollars, and he gave that all away. So he's not in need of money. But it no. it brings me back. To, I mean, I I like watching documentaries on making of movies, and I saw one recently right. on the making of Superman. And what fascinates me are, 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 is the producer Ilya Salkind. And, mm -hmm. you know, him, uh, the, the guys, the, the Israelis that ran um, uh, Canon Films, you don't... Yeah, Golden and, Gold, with it, Golden and Golbus, right? Yeah, yeah. They, I, you don't see people taking risks like that anymore. They threw everything they could, and if those any of their movies failed, they would have uh, been bankrupt many times over. But you don't right. have people taking risks. You don't have people... Yeah going on a limb because something like Superman in the seventies was not guaranteed. Right. You know? Yeah. But what, what happens? That film sets the standard. And for actually, that's the first one I remember seeing in theaters. I don't remember seeing star Wars. I don't, cause star Wars came out 73. So I don't, I don't think I saw it in theaters. Superman. I remember seeing in the theater. I remember that's the first film I saw. Then when I saw the director's cut that, 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 um, Donna wanted to do, it made the film better. So if you seen the, now we're here to geek out about this. So we see director's cut. He reveals himself. He flies back to Fort Solitude and talks to Jorel what happened. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, it makes the film better. Because, you know, Jorel tells him about, well, you know, you want your anonymity because you don't want to do that, you know. And it, it's kind of fascinating because you see that bond where he goes, it felt, he goes, it, I felt, ha I felt, this is what I wanted to do. And if you're a fan of Superman, that's the whole idea of why Jorel sent him to, to Earth to inspire. You know, you know, to, to inspire people. That's that. I think that's what the original creators of the of the of the comic book wanted of of Superman. That's you know, of that. So I think that's kind of fascinating. That's the case. But I, you are right. I mean, if you will, like, like think of it like last year or this year. The two best films that were up for best picture: La La Land and Moonlight. One film dealt with a very Hollywood style romantic story, well shot. Other film dealt with a black man coming out being. Trying to deal with the sexuality, mm -hmm. we can. We not, there's not. There's, there's not even a, a toss up. We know which film is going to get the promotion and that, right? That's La La Land. But yeah. which film is better? Now I saw both films and I thought I did what, what Damien did with La La Land. I was. It wasn't my cup of tea. I liked it, but I thought what Barry Jenkins did with Moonlight was a much more harder thing to do because it's a subject matter that's not going to be easy to dictate as to characters who are young and white in Hollywood, doing their thing, meeting. It's like that fan, and, and, and they're all dancing. Yeah, not like this black kid growing up in Liberty City in Florida, dealing with the sexuality and dealing, and it's done well, the film's done in three acts, that you, at the end of the film, feel for Chiron when he finally comes to terms with sexuality. So it's like that. So for every La La Land that makes a lot of money, there's a moonlight that people love watching. Now think about Get Out. Who, I didn't see that coming. I saw it twice. That film literally just was like, you know, what you didn't think you who would thought a film about this, you know, is one, you know, even though we're like in we're, we're close to October and we're probably going to do more of the best films of the year. That's up there, man. Yeah. That film is up there. That film that that's up there. So it's tough. But here's the thing, though, though, even though it is kind of harder, it's even easier now because you got YouTube, you got Vimeo. You have other options. So if you have a computer and you have a iPhone, uh, that film that was shot on the iPhone a couple of years ago, I think it was Sunshine, I, I, I think it is, that film was shot, it's possible. So you don't need to go to Studio Way because if you go to Studio Way, it's their money, it's their rules. You do it yourself, it's on you. And what's, you know, it's, you know that's what it kind of is. You know, when you're in school and college and you're shooting a film with your friends, that's kind of, that's what it was. Now, professionally, you can do the same thing. You know, if you have the skill set, you can do it yourself. Because there's a market out there for you. If you go the Hollywood way, it's their rules because it's their money. But if you do it yourself, you can say, you know what? I did it my way. I had my funds. Good or bad, I did it. And you're going to say, you know, you at least can say to yourself, you know, go for the Hell Mary Pass. I did it. I made my movie. Good or bad, is, is out there. Now, now, think of the canon films. Back then, you think much about it. But now they're called classics. There was a guy at the movie theater, and his fiance gave him a canon pin. I was like, where'd you get that pin? My fiance gave it to me. I said, you should marry that woman. That's 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 
the trade-off of it is that through time, kind of like with Andy Warhol or even kind of like Vincent Van Gogh, the, these films, bad or not, have will have a shelf life because now because of internet or back when we were younger, VHS or DVDs, you know, it's out there. You know, so you got you got nothing to do. I mean, if you think I mean, think about it. If let's say, for instance, in Hollywood, okay, well, let's say there are, let's say there are about a thousand movies that get made. That's more or less. Of that thousand, there are going to be at least maybe twenty that will make their money back. And of that twenty, maybe ten will surpass their budget and will make. A lot of money. Like uh, a number one film this week was Kings and Golden Circle, but it made over through three hundred million dollars for a thirty-five million dollar budget. Boom! So it's possible. They want sure things. Remember, it's this. It's business. It's about investment. If I give you six million dollars for this film, will I get my six million dollars back? If I give you fifty million dollars, will I get my fifty million dollars back? But if you're, you know, when you're Tom Cruise and you're doing Mission Impossible. That's, the film's guaranteed going to make hundred million automatically because Tom Cruise films make money. The Mummy was a terrible movie. That film probably made over hundred million dollars. So it's about that. It's it's the, they want a sure thing. That's the reason. That's the reason why it's like that. And what's good about us for geeks is that we can still be selected. We still, you know, I mean, you know, for I mean, you, you're in Portland. I'm in New York, so I'm quite sure cheaper in Portland is in New York to get go to a movie. So if I'm putting my money down on a film, I'm gonna is the reason why I'm seeing that movie. So whether it's a filmmaker or an actor I like or a subject I'm into, I'm gonna see that movie. Or I have I can go to Bam here in Brooklyn and catch some old movies like Dead Jonathan Demi retrospective because he passed away. So I I get I get a chance to see, but I want to see Marriage to the Mob. I want to see on the big screen. I've seen Marriage to the Mob before, so I want to see that. So there are options for it now. There's always there's always a way. And now with Netflix and Hulu and Yahoo, no Yahoo, uh, Amazon. Sorry, you know it doesn't make a difference anymore. You got Netflix is basically saying bump the studios, come to us. Think about it. You have there's um Jerry Seinfeld just signed a deal with Netflix to do his little special. He could go anywhere he wants to. There's a, Dave Chappelle has another, I think, is coming. Chris Rock has a special coming out with Netflix, and, and I think sometime next year. So, you know, it's, there's enough players in the game. It's like, we're not, we believe in your project. Come, come with us. And that's what, that's what you want. You, you know, as long as you have something that people want to watch or hear or see, that's not going to be a problem, man. It's, you know, it's always, you know, they just want, they want a sure thing. They want to say, if I do X, do I get Y back? And it's a gamble, you know. But if you have the, like I said, I, when I heard Spielberg had to get was trying hard to get money, I shook. That make I'm like that makes sense to me. Except you know, think about Spielberg. Let's talk about Steven Spielberg. That's a good example. Except for 1941, that movie. Almost every Spielberg movie has made money and then some, right? Mm-hmm. He's been a guaranteed. You hit that button, get cash back. Yep. Right. So when he can't get money to make a film. Think about that. That's kind of that's that's a that's huge. That's like wow. Steven Spielberg cannot get funding for a film. He does. He can use his own money, but you know he does it smart and does it that way. So the new Spielberg is now J.J. Abrams. J.J. is now his production company, Bad Robot, is producing Mission Impossible and also has a Star Wars film. So J.J. is doing Steven Spielberg 2.0. <laughs> he can still make the movies. He's going to do the la- he's going to do the last Star Wars movie coming out after 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 the Ryan Johnson won The Last Jedi, and he's still producing Mission Impossible movies for Tom Cruise. So that's you know, that's the game right there, man. That's how you do it. You and know? he's he's still producing the Star Trek movies as well. And, and exactly. The, and the funny thing about uh JJ, I'm sure you probably already know this, but when he was fifteen, um, Spielberg actually uh, sent his old eight millimeter home movies to JJ to I guess f- fix them up or something when he was fifteen, and he ended up uh, yeah. uh, introducing himself to him at that time. And then JJ yeah. went on to his, the first movie he wrote was I believe regarding Henry, the yep. mediocre Harrison Ford, and then right. uh, and then of Felicity, but then Alias. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. Alias. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah, Alias. You know, I got you. I give credit. I mean, I was watching that. A couple of mu- a couple of months ago, just rewind. I was like, "Ooh, I gotta watch it again." Because Vartan, uh, I think uh, Bradley Cooper's in it as well. So you, so yeah, that's that's a good head hotbed of of. Um, yeah, I'm, you still hear me? I'm still here, right? Yep. Okay, so that's a good hotbed of really talented actors. So yeah, it's kind of if you watch it again when you have more time, you can see the 
the coolness of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. With that, even JJ's first film he did, uh, which was um, Mission Impossible, was a uh, was Star Trek the first one he did. The first one he actually did. No, I or was it eight millimeter? It might have been Rogue Nation, the Mission Impossible. Uh, one? Uh, oh, you mean oh, Mission Impossible three? Uh, you you know uh, you know we are you and I are both geeks, so we're gonna look this up right now. But I think I I I think you. I think you're. I, I think you're right. I think it was the mission. In yeah, I, I am, think it was. I have IMDb up right now. First movie, Mission Impossible Three in two thousand six. Okay, so look at that. So look at look. If it, it it was, it felt like a TV. It kept on moving, 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 moving. What's wrong with being a filmmaker? That's good. You know when to keep it still. Know when to keep it going. You know, like I said, I, I always tell folks, I still think the first Mission Impossible was the one that was closest to the TV show. A lot of double entendre. They're getting back to it now because Chris McCrary, who, who is awesome, is taking it over. So I like what he's doing with that miss as well. This is, where, this is good stuff to geek out about because you, cause you have a filmmaker that's going to really go, he's going to really get it going. It's going to be one of those things like, yep, yeah, we got this. This is going to be good. We're going to really go, go with the flow. With that movie, and that's what geeks me out. When I get when you when I I'm a fan of a filmmaker, and I know that he or she's gonna really pull it off. It's gonna be awesome. Like uh, Catherine Bigelow in Detroit caught that a couple of nights a couple of weeks ago. Kind of tough film because it it came, the film. Am I still there? You still got me? Yep, I got you. Gotcha. So um, like that's a good that's a film. I that film was kind of tough to watch at the time because of what happened in Charlottesville. But Catherine Bigelow is definitely no joke. You know, strain, no people sleep on strange days. Strange days is probably one of her really best films. So much detail or Hey, the original point break. You can't go wrong with that. Johnny Utah. Boom, boom. <laughs> can't, can cannot go on that. The remake of that was really sad. When I heard they remade that, I was like, all right, goodbye. Good night, everyone. I was, I was that. Now that's the one thing that that we, I, I want to get your opinion about. Since you asked me, what's your feeling on these remakes, man? What is your feeling on all these films coming back? I mean, they're doing new versions of them. What what's your feeling about that? Well, I think with a remake, I, I I'm not against them off the bat because there there are some good films out there that are remakes. I mean, you know, I, I, while I'm not a fan of it, it has its fans. Scarface from '83 was a remake. Right. You can take a central idea of a story and remake it, but the problem comes when you don't offer anything new. Like mm-hmm. like the Ghostbusters uh, remake that came out in 2016, um, and I think they made a bad mistake by doing a hard remake and it, you know pretending the other universe didn't exist, which I think did a real disservice to it. And then there was all that nonsense uh, sexist crap that went on, especially with Leslie Jones. I felt horrible with her, but... The, the oh, movie, yeah. The movie did not bring anything new to the to the to the page, and you know, mm-hmm. I I if you're going to do a remake, have a reason for it. You know, whether right. whether it be a new actor, a new take, a, a new version. You know, I mean, I think one of the worst remakes I ever saw was Gus Van Zandt's Psycho. That oh god, let's let's not talk about that. I I was yeah. I was I think Hitchcock was spinning in his grave because. If you're going to do a film like that, you got to take it to a whole new level. And I couldn't get through. I was like, what is Gus trying to do? I, I, I didn't get it. I, I mean, he must have got paid, you know, must have paid a lot of money. I, listen, if you're going to make the money, no, no hating over here. But, I'm, but at some point, man, you're like, come on, you got to go. Oh, they were you just know. totally off. I mean, and that movie started my hatred for Vince Vaughn, too, because he, he played Norman Bates as if he had something to hide. Where, yeah. where Anthony Perkins... In his mind, he was crazy, so he didn't know when he turned into mother. So when, yeah. when he was getting confronted by you know um, Marion's sister and and other people, he didn't know. Right. He was trying to defend his mother because he thought his mother did the killings. Yet Vince right. Vaughn played it guilty, and then and then how they changed the the shower scene where they actually showed Anne Hache with wounds, and then and then they had that weird cut shot where. Um, birds were flying away d- uh, during the 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 shower scene. That just is like, why add that? If mm-hmm. you, if you proclaim it's supposed to be a shot for shot remake, why toss something new in there? Right. Yeah. I. I. You know, it's funny. I, I gotta watch that again because I was just like, oh my god, what's 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 going on? What's happening? I gotta. I. I gotta. You know, thanks for telling me that, man. I, I'll put it on the list to check out one again because I. I when I saw it, I was like, oh god, man. It's kind of it's. 
you know, it's like when he did taking the penalty one, two, three. It's like that. It's like, come on, man. You, you're gonna, you know, they, and this, and you forget that's the second time they did that. They did it before as a TV movie. You know, I'm a New York guy, so when I'm looking for all these subways, like that's not New York subway. That's that's a van. That's Kenny and a subway. So yeah, it's one of those things, man. But like I said, you know, we don't. It's one of my good friends said it online about people were kind of getting upset with the uh, comic books and Superman, Batman, whatever. And my friend said this: Look. We don't own those rights. Those are owned by corporations. We hope the corporation hires someone to make it so it appeals to us geeks that we like it, but also makes money. Right. But we don't own it. So when, so when people are upset, like Spider-Man Homecoming, I liked it because I thought the actor looked like Spider-Man, a scrawny, geeky, 16-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. That's, what the, that's the Spider-Man you know. Nothing against Tobey Maguire, nothing against... It's Andrew McCart, you know Andrew uh, Andrew McCarthy. McCart- Andrew McCarthy, that's the actor. Um, Garfield. Andrew Garfield, excuse me. Yeah, nothing against those two. I just thought this Spider Man was something that was a lot more closer to what I read in the comic book. A scrawny, wisecracking kid. Like uh, you, you just saw Spider Man Homecoming, right? Oh yeah. So the fact that he acts like a kid in this age, what's he doing? He's putting on YouTube. He's we're in this battle. I mean, that is. I'm like, that's exactly what a teenager today would do. Right, not being aware of the environment that made it so. I was, I liked the film. I was happy. Michael Keaton flipped it. Love, I love man. I, I'm glad he's back in t- back acting. Man, he played. He's one of those actors that can really play a bad guy, a a heavy, to the point where you believe it's like okay, you believe him. It's not. He, he's he's invested in that. You'd be like, all right, I get you. Yeah, I I'm, like that about. My, him. I like that. Michael Keaton, one of one of our best actors today, and and if I, he's th- thanks to Batman money, he he can take whatever film role he wants. He can pick and choose. So yeah, I know there's one I really want to see that's out in theaters now. American Assassin that he's in, um, based off of a Finn, yeah. Fl- Vince Flynn's books uh, with the main mm. character Mitch Rapp. Uh, Vince Flynn actually did uh, some consulting work with the TV show Twenty Four during some of their highly rated seasons of uh, seasons four and five. Um, so okay, kind of kind of along those lines right there, but. But Spider Man Homecoming was was great, and I love the the scene in the in the in the bank when the the robbers with the Avengers mask on were trying to yeah. take the money, and then he beats them all up, and then where the, the where he's like, "Whoa, that was cool." What teenager wouldn't yeah. think that if they did that? I mean, that that's what, like so it, it made it they it it made it more realistic, and I and honestly, that's not for it's funny for us. For, I can't speak for you, but for me as a geek, film geek like this, just make give if we're smart. Just follow, really, if you go, like, that's why I think Nolan's Batman really set the tone. Like, um, the, I'm, wa- I'm watching The Dark Knight, right? Still, I, st- I still think probably my favorite film that, but I think the opening of, Bar- of Batman Rises with Bane is incredible. But you watch the film, and, you, and I'm watching it one night, and I said, you know, he did it right. The Joker is a psychopath. He, when a guy says you're crazy, no, I'm not. I'm like, that's the Joker. Joker's not crazy. Joker is very, Joker knows exactly what he's doing. Mm-hmm. There's, when that film came out, it was I, I gotta find it. Some psychology, uh, some somebody they did a psychological profile of Batman and Joker, and just by the comic books and whatever, and it basically said they're the same. They're two sides of the same coin. Both of them have their methods to get it done, and they don't care what you think about it. Batman doesn't kill people. Joker has no morals in killing someone. They're both polar opposites. So when you get that in the film and. I think about today. I was like, "What?" I mean, I mean, listen, man. Heath Ledger. If I mean, I, I, I want. I'm, I'm my condolences to his family. And but as an, as an, act, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm. It, it's sad he's gone because I'm quite sure he would have done some other things incredible. But that Joker was. I mean, talk about going. I mean, just. Uh, I think about today. I'm like, I, I. That's the best Joker ever. I mean, Keaton. I mean, that's what you know. Nicholson had his point. Nicholson had it was was good because Nicholson had some points, but. He took it to a whole new level. He made it more realistic. Like you could see, you could actually see somebody do that, which is kind of sad because that's kind of what happened in a shooting. Dare I say, when a guy was kind of like that. So, but in terms of us as a fan, I'm like, that's the Joker I know. Yeah. So then when I saw Dark Back Dark Knight Rises with Bane, I'm like, that's the Bane I kind of like. A very calculated, smart, not the Bane you see in the Schumacher. Oh. Or even the Bane that was even in the animated series, which I grew up watching as a kid. But that was the Bane that was like, yeah, we know who you are, Batman. We haven't, for- you have- we haven't forgotten about you. You opened the door, so we're coming. And that, 
I mean, think about three. three look how look how gray three is. I mean, or Dark Knight Rises. Bane, you know, Batman's been going for about what? I think over a year. Bane's in town. Something's happening. We see him come up, and even Alpha's like, "Listen, you're done. You don't own the city anything, man." That's a good film. Where it's like, there's that moral dilemma. You know, you kind of, you know, and you know, and, you know what happened? That he didn't hear him. Gets his back broken, like in the comic book. Has to go to some place to get to come back. And in the meantime, Bane and his minions are just destroying Gotham City, knowing that it's going, knowing that it's going to blow up. There's no way of saving the city. So for us, as as fans of the movie, we're just like, we're just waiting. We're we you got us. We're eating our popcorn, eating our eating our juju fruit, jujus, and just kind of just like we got it. <laughs> Come on, it's coming more. That's what's great. That's what's kind of nice about it. That's the reason why as a as a film geek, when when it's done well like that, it's worth the ride because we're all vested from the minute that the minute the lights go dark after the trailer and we see the opening for the Ever Studio, you gotta get us. You gotta have us in that in, in that. And some of us are coming in already ready. To do that, you gotta you gotta have us in there, and it, and it's and, I, and I, th- I think I think it's possible. I think it's just that you know you got too many hands in a cookie jar, which makes sense because you have people saying, "Well, this is my money's what I'm due." So you have that, you know that, and and that's what's uh you know that's kind of that, that's 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 one downside of, of doing it that way is you you have that. So you know, like I said you can always not go to the movie. You know, you don't have to support the money, but you know we're geeks, so it's gonna if it's gonna be Justice League. I'm going to see. It. I don't know about you, Thor. I'm going to. See, I'm going to see that. You know. Yeah. You know, Black Panther. Oh, I'm going to be. I'm going to be online to see that movie. I cannot <laughs> wait. I'm cannot wait to see that. I'm going to Comic Con next week here in New York. So, so they haven't. They kind of haven't. They kind of announced the panels. When they have announced the panels, kind of. I'm hoping that we get to see another. We see an, either a new trailer for it. It's either hopefully. Either, hopefully, it'll be before Thor. But they, they got hands on the trailer. This is. It's been too long. It's been it's been a couple of months. We got we know the we I know we know it's still in post. Yeah, yeah I guess hit, 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 hit another trailer. Here's, here's another, hit us hit us with another trailer. Tell us more about uh, Wakanda. I'm hope I'm hoping that's the case. I well I did I, I didn't hear a rumor about Black Panther, but I did hear a rumor that we may be very soon gazing upon the first official release of the Avengers Infinity War trailer. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. We, can't, we, I, can't, I can't wait. Yeah, word is they may end up releasing it around the time uh, Inhumans uh, debuts on ABC. So a few days from now. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I got to, I got to my calendar. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't wait for Black Panther myself, and I'm glad that Marvel is finally opening the door for movies like Black Panther, for Captain Marvel, bringing uh, Brie Larson in. I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, they, and they need, they really need to make a Black Widow movie before Scarlett Johansson gets tired of that role. Oh well, okay. So, oh, speaking of which, have you, did you seen the new trailer for the uh, for uh, Tomb Raider with uh, Elise Vickers as uh, Laura Croft? I have not, but I've seen uh, the actress as Laura Croft, and I just don't buy it. Uh, to me, Laura Croft was always exotic, which is why Angelina Jolie I felt was perfect for that role. Um, right. But I, I, I have I have to watch the trailer to give a full assessment. But just by by her, her image alone, I, I'm not buying it yet. What do you think? The trailer is interesting because it it's, I guess in body type she's a lot tinier than she's not as big. Angelina Jolie is probably I think like five foot five 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 four. Vickers is like maybe five, maybe a little shorter. Oh, man. So ha, depending depending how they shoot her, you know, I mean, she has a, you know she's a good actress. She has, she has a great accent for it. It's you know it's I mean it, like I said the first Tomb Raider I actually that I it's funny those first Tomb Raiders I saw in the theater I did when Angelina Jolie was in them I will say that. I'll, you know, like I said, you know, I'll give. I'm curious to see the. Tra- it's not. I mean, it gets it gets, gets my attention. I, I'll if I see the trailer on the big screen, I may decide that moment. But I was just, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, we're, like I said, we're getting. You know, it's it's. You know, we're in October. We're getting close to October. So now we're getting. You know, this this is Oscar time. So all the films we're going to see all these films come out now. They're really hitting up heavy Oscar. Maybe after December 25th, we'll get inundated because they can because they want to qualify. For uh, for for Academy, we'll start seeing that. So I don't know. I mean, it's it's. I'm curious. I, I'll definitely. I mean, you know, with, I I see this trailer on the big on the big screen, but that looks. It's my ears are perked. I don't know. It's like I'm all going to see this, but my ears are kind of up there. I'm interesting. Uh, I'll I'll definitely catch that if uh, it comes out. But you know, like the other like um, besides uh, you know uh, with Infinity Wars, I I like Logan. I thought Logan was the best way to say goodbye to Patrick Stewart. 
and to Hugh Jackman. But that I love that film because it showed how powerful Charles is, but how susceptible he is as well. The fact that he had uh, he had epilepsy and he couldn't control his powers was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. So imagine he was cerebral and had that seizure. He could have killed everyone on the planet. That's what I'm talking about realism. That blew my... When I saw it in the theater, I was like, wow. That was... You know, that, I mean, it's kind of sad to see them go, but I said, you know what? I think both of them have done us a service because those are the... Re- I mean, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine the first time, you didn't think so, but he, he grew into it. But Patrick Stewart, that was coming down... I saw that coming down the block. He was the only one actor I could thought that could really play Professor Xavier with that with that gravitas and having his homeboy... Um, Ian, oh, not Ian. Uh, yeah, Ian McKellen yeah. as Magneto means they're both good friends of each other. It's really fascinating. I was hoping they would do like an origins with Magneto. I was hope because he's one of my favorite mutants, and to have fast because I was hoping they would do that with Fast Bender to really talk about that because then you can segue into him having his kids, like having Wanda and Pedro. But I love to see him with you know you know with the league you know you know with you know with with you know with the, with the Hellfire. I think Hellfire. Circle was it? I'm sorry, my Marvel geek is not as good as my friend. I think Club, a, yeah, yeah. It, it was Shaw and him. I love to see that. So who knows what happens? But I know you talked on a previous podcast how Fox finally has lost the rights to Fantastic Four. That, that, I, and, I, was, I speculated on that. I, I hope that that is the case, but you never know. They, they need to. They, they need to. I mean, listen. The fact that the first three movies had Doom as their friend means no, Victor Doom was never friends with them. That's what bugs my mind with that. So who knows? Like you know, I mean, because that's because I mean, truth be told, the first two Fantastic Four movies, which were terrible, made gobs of money, oogles of money. Both of them made money. And, and the first one, terrible. The, and the first one with yeah. uh, Jessica Alba, it, it was. Yeah. It, it, I would say it was a mediocre film. It it, mm-hmm. it, it was serviceable. It wasn't mm-hmm. bad. The second one, not so good. But the the one th- that really upsets me is the Josh Trank one, and that's just because Josh Trank really, really blew it. And oh yeah, I, I mean he had a meltdown, and I, I, he just he's a textbook example of how not to direct a movie and how not to mm-hmm. act after you make mistakes in a movie because apart from maybe some you know third rate TV shows he's not going to get work again because of this well you know but but you know with chronicle which was a great film i i think that's a super film yeah, yeah but you know it had i mean it's he still listen, listen he still has that first one to fall back on if he's smart he writes something different I just think you know. I mean, I, from what I was reading about, there was there were script issues, there were producing issues. There was a lot of there was a lot of things going on. I think at one point he was supposed to be up for doing the Star Wars movies. I from, supposedly. Yeah, I think but he, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, but his, I mean, like, listen, you know, we, you know, we don't know. I mean, well, I'll say this, on a film set with producers, there's all the all the there's all this higher up. I'll give you a good example. I worked on Eight Mile. So more people are impressed I worked on an Eminem movie than on The Matrix, to be honest with you. That's, that's kind of weird saying that, but yeah. But I worked on 8 Mile, and my, one of my bosses called me into the office and said, hey, no, I got some bad news. I said, what's up? Am I fired? No, you're not fired. He goes, your name's not going to credits. I said, why? And he said to me, looked at me point blank and told me, well, the producer who was on the film, was ha- it was a power play. So... For every person she couldn't have on, there's one person she didn't want to have on, and she just picked your name. And I said, what did I do to him? And she goes, you didn't do anything. It's just a power play. I still got paid for it, got credit for it. But there's stuff behind the scenes like that that happens more people realize in filmmaking because it's about power. When you're on a film set, and usually the director is the one that runs the show. Usually. Yeah. Unless the producer is the one running the show, right? So, like, if it's James Cameron, James Cameron's running the show. Yeah. If it's uh, if 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 it's Bri- now if it's Brian Grazer, say from Imagine, yeah, you're running the show, but Brian Grazer could say, hey, don't do it this way. That's a little different. Mm-hmm. So it's about that. It's 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 a it's power. It's really it's really about I'm gonna flex as much power as I can because I can. And if you don't like it, whatever. And you know, and a lot of times you're thinking it's the, it's the director, but most. But times it's usually you know like I said it's, it's always this uh, it's it's the, those behind the scenes 
it's it's power, you know, and it you know it kind of sucks sometimes because it's like, is it you know does it make it better? Like um, I was uh, reading, there was an interview in the New York Times last last week, and they about, about a Fatal Attraction, right? About yeah. that movie. So they so the reporter talked to Sherry Lansing at the time before she was head of Paramount was producing a movie. Adrian Lyne, who directed it, uh, Michael Douglas, Glenn Close, and and Archer. And they talked about how how the film came about. How I think at one point I think the Palmos wanted to do it but didn't do it. Adrian Adrian just finished doing Flashdance and did it. And the article talked about the ending of the movie. Now, if you know the end of the film, Alex gets shot by by the uh, by Ann Archer, the, the the wife. The in the original film, she kills herself when Michael Douglas walks. There's a scene where Michael Douglas goes to the house and say, you know about her, you know stalking her. Her daughter goes to her house and you know walks through the house, and Alex supposedly is playing Madame Butterfly, kills herself. Mm-hmm. In Hollywood, as you know, they have screenings, test audience, and they go by test audience. So test audience, test audience, you like it or not, which I think is terrible. The audience hated it. They wanted they when they saw the film, Alex needed to get her comeuppance. So they had to reshoot the scene, and Glenn Close's character got shot. Glenn Close said, "I wanted you know Glenn Close didn't see did did not see her as a." Psycho. She said she just had. She's dealing with the bet. Was dealing with something a bad. I, I don't want to misquote her. Um, uh, she said about. Um, I think she said the feeling of it was she want. She you know Alex was in a bad position. I'd been there before when a when a when you hit when you, when you hit on a guy. She said when I got turned down, everyone was a feeling when when you ask a guy out and a guy says no. So for her, it was like that. But William Hurt told her, "Hey, listen, it's no longer yours." Be happy, leave it out there. So you're an actor sometimes, you got to pick the battle. You got to say, you know, once the film is done, you're an actor, you're done. You do your ADRs and reshoots, you're on to the next film. That's, that's business. You shoot the film, you're done for the day, go to your next film project. Unless, you know, unless you have the power to do more about it, you know, you, you do that. So sometimes, you, you know, with, with films like that, you know, with the, with the vibe and feeling of it, you know, it... it it's, po- it's politics, man. It, it sucks sometimes. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm not in L.A. anymore is politics working at the company. Now, now, mind you, I'm not a big producer. This is on the lower level of a, in a sound house. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll just, to be, I'll just be respectful and fair. There are things that happened that really uh, were kind of, that was kind of like, a, kind of bad. And, you know, the company I was at was at the point of really being one of the few independent Sound houses in Los Angeles, right? right? Sound Deluxe was one of the big was was one of the big ones. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, I forgot the guy's name. They did they did Braveheart. Then you had the guys up in Skywalker. Then you had uh, others. You had um, um, other sound houses in in California. We were one of the few independent ones that were busy working because my boss did the Matrix, and because my boss and the Wachowski siblings now. You know, he got on. You know, he he was. You know, it, it's it's like that. So it's it's always those things that you know those things the scenes that we don't see because all we care about is the behind the, is the product. But since you and I geek out about it, it's reading about the making of the film and the behind the scenes stuff. We go, oh fuck, that's crazy. Didn't see that coming. Yeah, and I think for me that what I just don't like about how Josh Trank handled it, handled it is it's something you touched upon. It's politics. You know, I think of Mark Webb uh, with The Amazing Spider-Man 2. That was a disaster, but he handled it the right way. Josh Trank, on yeah. the other hand, was, you know, the f- first day that Fantastic Four was in theaters, he was hitting Twitter and, and blaming everybody but himself. He didn't play play it right. And right. Th- that that just struck me the wrong way in a, on a personal thing because it's just like, you know, yeah. I, I, I get that the, the, the entire... The fault of that movie does not fall in Josh Trank's lap. It's it's a whole organization of people putting that movie out, and there's blame everywhere. Mm. But how he handled it really just rubbed my feathers the wrong way to the point to where yeah. if, if he doesn't work again, I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, he was young. I mean, it was like twenty. I've, I mean, he was young. I mean, look at Chronicle. When I saw that film, I was like, I just seen it there. I saw it on TV, and I was like, oh wow, this is a kick, kick-ass movie. Mm-hmm. Right, really, you know, you know, you know, these three guys get the get these powers. Michael B. Jordan's in it. Really, this, you know, the whole thing, which is kind of, which is incredible. I mean, I didn't, I, you know, you see the film, you go, what's this film? It's like this little hit. You know, it ha- like I said, it happens sometimes, man. Like, you know, if you, you know, you gotta, 
you gotta know how to, you gotta know how to pick your battles. Right. You gotta know how to say, you know what? Now he could now could he write to his to the producers, of course, to his agent. Yeah, keep your mouth shut. Nothing you can do about it. Go to the next film because yep. you don't have the you don't have the cachet to do that. You just make it more. You see more. You become more of a problem, which means who won't work with you, right? Yeah. Like I said, and also remember, people on the set. If you're good, I've always learned this from day one, man. On if you're good to people, most people on most of those who work in the industry are blue collar folks, right? Right. They're not the executives. They're not the director, the producers. They're the other ones that are literally doing everything else. They're the can. They're the grips. They're 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 set. They're designed. They're makeup. They're all the people around that really prop that make it that make it good for for the for the actors and the other crew members. So if you're bad to them, they won't forget that. They'll never, they'll never forget that, and they, and they will talk, and they will tell people, yeah, this guy was a dickhead, this guy was an asshole, like, uh, like another, uh, the <laughs> famous Stallone story. Working on, uh, uh, I, I heard about it work when he worked on, I think, uh, Cliffhanger. I'm a sound guy, so you know, when I worked on sets, we would mic people. Usually, when this, when the filming was done for the day, or when you, or when you get ready to go to the next scene, you turn off your mic pack and turn it back on because you don't want to have a conversation. So Stallone did not do that. So the urban legend that Stallone, supposedly Stallone was getting a blowjob while the mic was on. He said, like, the famous line of, yeah, cradle my balls, work the shaft. That became an inside. Oh, it was, um, it was, it was uh, the, the, tu- the tunnel movie, uh, Lockout or Lockdown. I think that's the one that, that was known about that. So I said, word gets out, man. You know, it, 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 it's a small, you know, when you're on a set, it's a small community. Those folks know each other. They work together. And nine times out of ten, they're going to be working together with each other on other films. So you want to be that actor that's like nice and really easy, really key. You want to be that producer that's being really respectful, director that's being that's being nice. You don't want to be that one that's being an asshole and being a tyrant. Unless that's how you get things better because of that. But like I said, it, it's a we and especially in that and especially in that business, it's a small world. People, that person that you're addicted to. Most of the time, in the future, maybe someone need, you need a job from or a connection. So why, you know, don't be that guy or gal. Just be respectful. Most people in sets know what they're doing, and you know they know that you're under a lot of stress as a as a director or an actor. They're not going to bug you and bother you. They're going to help you. Gonna, they're going to help you out. They're going to make your life easy. So, you know, I learned that from day one. Uh, you know, you, you know, working on a, you know, coming to Los Angeles first time, working on a independent film. And just being humble and just being respectful of that, regardless of your of your pay grade, you know, every, you know, you come, you know, when that when you got a crew that works for you like that, they'll go, to, you know, they'll go to war for you, man. They'll 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 go to war for you when they know you're behind something, and more importantly, they'll also will be, you know, they, they'll they'll be there for you. They know, you know, it's like it's nothing. This is a business, man. You know, as long as my paycheck don't balance at the end of the week, it's business. And if you're a talented filmmaker and you and people in front of your set. They're gonna work with you all the time. Yeah, you know, like I said, if you know, like Spielberg's notoriously known for keeping his for keeping on a schedule. Matter of fact, Clint Eastwood is known for after takes helping the crew move stuff around. So they love Clint Eastwood. So oh, and, they'll 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 die for him. And in Eastwood, I mean, in his eighties now, still directing because he has a reputation for always coming in under budget. You know, well ahead yeah. of time. Um, you know, and then you hear stories about, I, I forgot the guy's name, but he directed I Heart Huckabee's Three Kings with George Clooney and oh, Ice Cube. Oh, that, oh, David O. Russell. Yeah, he, there was this one video that I believe it was on the set of I Heart Huckabee's where he's just having a, it's not a screaming match with Lily Tomlin, he's just yeah. verbally berating her. And this is Lily Tomlin, right. whether you like her or not, she deserves her reputation as as an actress. Yeah. You know, and just... Well, yeah, but like I said, it, it could be an ego thing. Like, remember, this was... That was Russell's maybe third or fourth movie. He did Sleeping... Oh, he did, um... Uh, what's the one? The, uh... Sleeping with the Enemy, Sleeping with the Anger. I forgot the other movie. The first, the first ones he did, then he did that. Yeah, because you, you had a tape. That's almost like, all right, let's just calm down. Mm-hmm. And Lily's, like, saying to him, well, I don't know what you effing want. And 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 she made, she makes a valid point. Like, that, that's a... That film was kind of a tough. That film was one of those films that you got to have a game plan because it's so all over the place. Well, and then on Three Kings, uh, George Clooney ended up uh, beating David Russell's ass because he was uh, abusive to uh, crew members, and I guess he told yeah. them to stop, and they got into a fist fight, and, and yeah. I guess he was a perfect angel after that. But uh, that was uh, another troubled uh, a film shoot there. 
Yeah, but that's but it ha- happens sometimes, man. Like I said, I've been I've been on sets where direct where a director yelled at somebody for no reason. I've been on sets where I got yelled at for no reason. You know, it you have to. It's like you know, you know. I mean, for Clooney, you know, I said, you know, I mean, I, I remember Clooney was just was really was getting was really up and coming with that. I think Three Kings and then what Perfect Storm. Oh, um, um, out, of, out, out of sight. Dust of Dawn out of sight. So, 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 you know, you know, George was on his way, was moving on up. So George had that cloud and power and, and a great film too. And we see the end result, right? David Russell's best film so far, I think has been, um, Silver Lines Playbook from start to finish. A great film, mm-hmm. great acting, great directing. Really want, you know, I watched the film a couple of months ago and I was like, yeah, that, that's a, you know, that, you know, that's when he, that's when he's on point, that film and I, and, uh, like American Hustle, was just his, uh, was like, this is my version of or Scorsese doing, uh, uh, you know, doing Goodfellas, because <laughs> so many tracking shots, slow, so many slow dissolves, and I was like, hey, nothing's wrong with it, nothing's wrong with, imperson- with impersonating uh, Scorsese, he's one to go after, but incredible acting, like Jimmy Rettner, unsung in that movie, playing the, playing the Jersey politician, Amy Adams is good, Jennifer Lawrence is, Jennifer Lawrence, you know, Bradley Cooper really flipped it as that, Louis C.K., so, Christian Bale, you know, gained, you know, I think he gained weight again and yeah. kind of shaved his head. So when you get, you know, like I said, when you get good actors together that have fun playing like that, for us as a fan, we love it because we can, because re- it's, it's like, it's like going to a play. You're seeing all these actors that know each other and believe the words, believe the words and believe that you're just like, oh, I love this, man. This is great. We're, this is popcorn time. We're going to have fun because yeah. we know it's going to be a great film. It's going to move. It's going to be awesome. We're just going to sit back and we're just going to like this because of that. So, like, a, when is Spielberg? When is Scorsese? When even I'll say Spike Lee. When you know when these talented filmmakers or good filmmakers, even Woody Allen, gets acts together, we're in the audience. We're like just salivating because we know it can be like a wrong edit or move. The film can be oh, this is just bad, or it could be something incredible that we're talking about for years. Or decades as 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 a as a as a good film, a film that when it comes on cable, we'll kind of you know we'll, we'll you know we'll kind of stop what we're doing and watch it. That's a that, that's a good film. When something comes on television that I like, and I'll just stop what I'm doing and just start watching it, even though I know I get up in like another couple of hours. If if God forbid, if I'm up and I see it, <laughs> I, I got I got to I, I got to watch it. Man. Gotta watch right. it. All right. Well, on that note, I think we'll uh, wrap things up here. Um, thank you again for uh, appearing on the show, and I uh, hope we can uh, do this again sometime. Oh, listen, man. I listen, uh, thank more for this. But, you know, listen, I mean, my pleasure, man. I mean, you guys geeking out about James Bond, I was like, ooh, ooh, let me <laughs> chime in because I, cause, cause I, I, I know exactly what you, what you guys are talking about. But, hey, listen, anytime you want me on, man, I, it's my pleasure, man. Thank you very much for having me on. Anytime. We'll do. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you next time. Definitely. All right. Bye. Trust me, I know what I'm doing.